What's going on, everyone, and welcome to Numbers Therapy. So a bit of background. We created Numbers Therapy originally to talk through the macro and bring on and showcase our experts in Metaverse HQ, and more specifically, so everyone can understand how all the big pieces fit together to make better decisions with NFTs and other investments using a balanced perspective, to learn about or from some of our people in the community, and to learn about different areas and opportunities out there, including different ways of thinking. More on Metaverse HQ, which we call MVHQ. MVHQ is the top Web3 trading and networking community, and we showcase traders, analysts, builders, and a variety of other rising experts in the space. All right, GMGM GM everyone, and welcome to Numbers Therapy episode 46. Today's episode titled Experimentation, Evolution, Christie's. Uh, purpose of numbers therapy, talk through the macro, operational, financial, technical, trading-based, other dimensions of Web3, putting the pieces together to help everyone understand the latest picture. They hear some incredible backstories and have some good laughs along the way. For everyone live, of course, if you have any questions, please drop them in. Whether it's an intro question or a more advanced one, we'll be sure to, to weave it in in the right place. Lastly, numbers therapy is rated NFA, as in none of what you hear in here is financial advice. So... Without further ado, and on to today's guest and episode. His guests, multiple, had a very recent noteworthy rise in the Web3, in Web3, in Web though this was seeded well before this. Their initial $8 open mint collection served to be bear market resistant, seeing immediate pricing pressure while capturing the spirits of memists across the world. Straight out the coattails of the Twitter takeover and related saga, this team leaned in directly, market this historical event, and inject social commentary. Since led to the impending auctioning of several of their pieces at Christie's, an unprecedented collection type and size. And seemingly, the wheels are always tur- turning, leveraging memes from within Web3 and Web2. There seems to be no, sh- no near-term shortage of memeable events, so it will be exciting to see what's to come. However, all of this is also happening while bringing innovation and technology progress into the space, driven, for example, by a digital push that this group has mobilized. Very happy to talk through the philosophies and thoughts and to have this group as new colleagues and friends. Let's stop here. Will there be more? Please, everyone, welcome Jack Butcher, Martin Clip, and Jaleel to the stage, everyone. Jack, Martin, Jaleel, how are we doing? Hey. Good Hello. evening. How are we? Good evening. Uh, and GE, G everything. Uh, it all fits. We've got a global audience. It, it all works totally. Um, really, really pleasure to have you all on. Really excited about it. Let's start at the top. Uh, Jack, if you can give a little bit of background on, you know, your pre-Web3 background, what, what was that looking like? And eventually, how did you find yourself within Web3 land? Uh, same same comment for you, Jaleel, and you, you, Martin, as well. Nice one. So uh, I'll do the TLDR, but basically, I was a graphic designer, started uh, my career in New York, bounced around a bunch of different um, creative shops doing all different commercial applications of graphic design. Started my own agency in 2017 or 2018 and ended up um, eventually transitioning that agency business to like a completely digital business called Visualize Value. And in building a digital business, just started the practice of publishing design work constantly. So um, as a means to meet people, to, to uh, win work. And this this experiment, essentially visualized value, became um, uh, Instagram and a Twitter account that probably has now published around a thousand pieces of artwork. And in uh, in twenty twenty in twenty twenty, when COVID was that when COVID hit or twenty nineteen, I forget. Yeah, so tw- in twenty twenty, it uh, built um, a couple of education products and started a completely online um, community around those education products. And it was actually through building that community that I, I met Jalil and um, I got to know about NFTs as a technology through people that were joining Visualized Value and kind of making that, um, making that observation or, or like, hey, if, you're, if, you're, if you've been publishing digital art, you should look at this, you know, this thing that's happening that allows you to, you know, assign real provenance to the work you're doing. And, um, yeah, we, we have been kind of 
down the rabbit hole since 2021 originally one of one stuff back then but now um in the bigger networked collection stuff since january with checks and um jalil has a, another story there for uh a collection that he built which i'll let him, him talk about hey sure hi everybody so um, I, I met Jack a few years ago through the Visualized Value community, as he mentioned. And when he started experimenting um, with NFTs, and my background is in, in software development, Web2 based stuff. Um, it, of course, also piqued my interest um, when he started dabbling with his one of one work. And then soon after, actually, we worked together on one PFP collection that we decided then to not release, but um, packed all of my learnings from that into a collection I launched in, in August and September, actually two. Um, first one was a free mint, got number one on Etherscan on that day, which was a crazy internet moment for me. And then uh, since then, basically, I was fully committed to Web3 development. Um, launched a little uh, actually paid uh, collection after that which also uh, worked out great made many met many interesting collectors and and and, and new people that i worked with etc and then finally january this year um got the opportunity to work with jack on checks and then later opepin um, but um yeah that's been a wild ride so yeah very happy it worked out that way Great background. And what about you, Martin? How do you, how, how do you land in Web3? How did that all happen in your side? I don't, I don't know if I have landed in Web3. I'm not quite sure where I am. Um, <laughs> I, um, so my, my background is actually quite different. Uh, I started as a photojournalist, fell into it um, when I was 15 years old, uh, started going on tour with uh, rock bands and basically playing video games with rock bands and mucking around. It was like the craziest things, like Eminem and people like that. Um, and then write, wrote about it. Uh, then I went from sideways for like PlayStation mags and Xbox mags and started going to lifestyle magazines. Um, ended up working for all the national newspapers uh, and then started my own magazine, uh, national magazine when I was 24. Um, and um, I had some fun with that. I had some great people. Um, did some really cool things. Ended up doing some travel and bits and bobs. Um, then started an agency uh, that looked after the interactions between brands and artists um, and the verticals of entertainment, whether it be music, film, fashion, uh, video games, and kind of put them all together. Um, and we did some really cool things like putting God of War together with Motley Crue and all kinds of mad things that we managed to get away with, and I'm quite sure how we did. Um, and then um, fast forward walking around in East London, and I saw these stick prints, stick figures painted in East London uh, of this artist painted them. Didn't know who he was. Um, and he was this homeless kid called Stick. And they really just made me smile. And I thought, well, if they make me smile, maybe they'll make other people smile. And I was organizing an award show, working on an award show at the time called the Q Awards, which is a bit like the Grammys for those in America. Um, and I asked, got hold of this artist, a mate of mine called, called uh, Wesley, um, got me in touch with this this guy. It was very kind of him. Um, found him somewhere because he was pretty much anonymous, and um, found this guy and, and spoke to him. And, and he agreed reluctantly to do this uh, tiny dancer print, this kind of dancing stick man for me uh, for this cure show. And we we gave the prints to the winners. Um, we gave them to the winners, and they. Um, and it's people like Bono and Chris Martin and uh, Brian May. And Brian May took a real shine to, to this guy's stick, invited him to his house, painting his house and stuff, which was amazing. Um, and then a few days later, um, Elton John had his 65th birthday. So I sent a tiny dancer print to Elton um, to go with his bus pass. Because when you're 65 in England, you get a bus pass and you can uh, use the bus for free. Uh, so he, he, he liked that, and uh, we sent it to the Evening Standard, and um, it went on like page three of the Evening Standard, like starry homeless, homeless artist, get starry clientele, and what have you. And this artist went from uh, he, you know, he was already a great artist, and he was doing amazing things. And we did a show, and the show, the physical work, sold out in like nine seconds, which I think is still the fastest selling show of any 
contemporary art in like history or something. Um, and, it, and it all kind of snowballed from there. And, and since then, I've, I've worked with a lot of physical artists. Um, we've done some amazing shows, done some really cool things with, with different artists. There's an artist called Abudia who, who did really, really well, who's doing really well right now. Uh, a phenomenal Spanish artist called Pijak, um, who was over with us in New York right now, doing some really cool stuff. Um, and, um, and then I, I kind of fell <laughs> into the digital side um, with, a, with a guy called Rafiq Anadol that you might have heard of. Um, and I was organizing a, uh, an event in Miami for Art Basel with Christie's and we took over the Rubel Museum, which is a really amazing musician, uh, museum, rather, amazing museum. And um, we took it over for about 40 people and had the McCullen do their, like, 1946 whiskey, which is like 75 grand a bottle. <clears throat> and we did a, a really cool um, exhibition with it. And then we had a tasting dinner. And on, on, I invited Rafiq down because he was, he was a mate. Um, so he came down with his wife, Efson. And uh, we all kind of like hung out, and, and he was incredibly, uh, just just really uh, such an incredibly magnetic character and such an inspiring person that all of us came away <laughs> from this meeting um, and this dinner. And we we read stuff where people had turned around and said, "Oh, you know, Rafik is the the next Da Vinci," and you kind of think, "Oh man, that's a load of bollocks." But you kind of listen to that sort of stuff, and and I I was one of those people. And then we, we came away, and you're like, you know what? They might just be right. Like he is, he is like the great. In my opinion, he is like the greatest of all time in terms of a digital artist. Phenomenal. Um, he's yeah. So <clears throat> that's that's him. Uh, and then so I kind of got into that rabbit hole. Really um, started getting into that world. Um, I did a. I organised a bunch of events for a bunch of Web three launches. Um, I, I put together the the launch party for Little Heroes and Star House in New York for NFT NYC, um, which was, I thought was a fun party. Um, that was, that was fun. Um, didn't have anything to do with the actual project itself, so to speak, but, um, the, uh, the party itself was, was, was awesome. Um, had a lot of sore heads in the morning. Um, and then, um, I got intrigued by checks and I, I'm a numbers guy and I'm a brand guy. And I, I started seeing this everywhere. And, the whole ethos and the distillation of Jack's work was phenomenal. And I, I was organizing a thing called the, um, the Alpha Summit at Soho House, uh, which was a, uh, we got actually MVHQ to host it. And uh, Mitch, who was an unbelievable host, actually, he did a really good job. I'm not going to make his ego too big, but he actually did a very, very good job. Um, and we, we hosted that. Uh, with like Sandbox and um, Rafiq and Edgar Plans came down and like all these, these people came down. So the next one, I wanted to get Jack. And I was trying to get him. And he doesn't have a Discord. He doesn't do anything. Like, he's a pain. He's like a ghost. So I couldn't get a hold of this guy. And I'm asking everyone. And like he's everywhere, but nowhere. And then Christie's invited me out to Beeple's launch um, in Charleston. And I, <laughs> I hadn't spent much time with Mike. and. Um, I wasn't too much into it, but I was curious. And I got to spend a lot of time with him and his family. And it was just the most lovely experience, like the, the genuine sort of heartfelt joy that they have, you know, whatever the attitude out outwardly is, like how they portray their work and everything else, just to know that they had so much passion for work and everything they do was great. Um, until the point at the party where people decided to do a physical airdrop. And he, uh, he did this airdrop where he pushed a button and all of these, these like airdrop pieces of paper <coughs> started flying from the sky with prints on and some of them had NFTs and what have you. And everyone started going mental. They'd all drunk way too much. There was a bunch of fights. I grabbed one, at which point I think I was probably rugby tackled by, I don't know, a small child or something. Um, knocked over and I get up and um, this guy who kind of had, will remain nameless um, said, uh, you're right, mate. Um, and he's with this other guy who was an English guy, big, big fella. I was like, hopefully he didn't push him over because I don't want to argue with him. And that was Jack. Um, and, um, it turns out that that person was, was Jack Butcher. And we got talking. I was like, mate, I've been trying to get hold of you for ages. It's two o'clock in the morning. We've all had enough to drink, but do you want to have a chat? Um, and I think at that point he 
decided to try and run away because it, it was a bit concerning that this idiot on the floor was, was trying to talk to him. Um, <clears throat> but we started talking about the evolution of checks and, and the way that it worked and the way that the Web3 to Web2 discussion, in a way, works and the dotted line between digital and physical works. And he had never, he'd never produced a, <clears throat> an actual print with a master printmaker. And for me, being a top-tier artist in the Web3 world um, and his distillation of values and the way that it all worked out, it, it made sense that we only go in at like the very, very, very highest level. So we, we got Jean Milan, who is Ed Rocher's printmaker. He's like in his 80s. And he is, <coughs> sorry, I've done a lot of these interviews. Um, <coughs> he's, he's like America's master printmaker, like the most celebrated printmaker in America. And he is a mate of mine. And, and I, first of all, I thought you'd kick me out of the room, but he was like, I love this and I've got to do this. And so Jack flew out a few days later. We arranged a meeting, went to downtown LA to his studio. He's got this massive press. Um, this this Mylar machine, which is from the 1950s. Um, it's like a tank, and it's an aircraft hanger. And that's what produces the prints. And everything's done by hand. Everything takes like 24 hours to make. And they are the things of beauty. Anyway, I've spoken for way too long, talked about way too many things, and I should probably go away. But that's what happened. That's where we are. And now we're in New York um, with the Christie's solo auction over Freeze New York, which is uh, interesting. So, so awesome. So let's, uh, thank you for the context. Let's connect some dots here. Before we do that, a couple shout outs that I think are worthwhile here. So a lot of dots that are connecting in, in all places. Certainly shout out Mitch, MBHQ, for putting on the event that you said and otherwise. Yes, Mitch. Uh, who's an MBHQ advisor, actually. So that's connecting as well. And I just want to make a special shout out to our resident Brit as well, who's typing in the background, who's Meg, uh, who's typing some funny stuff in the background. Ah, uh, Meg. Uh, appreciate all you know all, all the context that you're saying. So let's let's put this all together now. At this point, so everyone's familiar with checks, OpenPen, right, and how that worked. What what happened before that? Was checks the first thing that you released? Where you did were you degening first? You released something before, and as a te- how did that go prior to the checks release? So there was a few uh, like I originally started minting work on Foundation in 2021. Um, Someone, as I mentioned before, the people that were uh, trying to explain NFTs to me originally were pointing me to uh, OpenSea. And I went on OpenSea. I was like, it did not click for me. I, I just didn't uh, see didn't see a way to put my work on there in a way that I would be proud of it. It didn't really kind of didn't communicate the like what is possible to me and then as soon as i saw foundation and the you know the concept of a digital auction house that's when i started to understand uh what could be done and there's probably in 2021 probably a couple dozen pieces a couple dozen one of ones most of which were the compression of the ideas that make up this set of technologies so um trying to simplify some of the concepts beneath what we're here talking about so um if i had a screen share i would pull that up and 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 scroll through a couple of them but uh the most popular one was an image called nfts explained which is actually the genesis of the the use of the check mark in the work so i'll try and explain it verbally but there's essentially two rectangles on a black background the left one says JPEG, the right one says NFT, and in the top right-hand corner of the NFT, there is the, the blue check mark that we are all familiar with from, you know, choose, insert social platform of your choice that denotes authenticity, notability, um, you know, the idea of this implicit uh, level of trust like bestowed upon somebody so that was that to me was a symbol that kind of made more sense in this world than it did in the web 2 world where anybody reasonably familiar with social media knows that in many cases those blue check marks are for sale but just they weren't eight dollars for the last few years like you could uh 
pay people to write a couple Forbes articles about you and get yourself a blue check mark. So I've been thinking about what makes this set of technologies different for a long time. And I think the check mark, the, the genesis of checks as a project was kind of planted back then a couple of years ago. And then obviously um, the news cycle and the things that had been in the collective consciousness for um, this six months or so before checks was launched informed obviously the the approach to that project too but it's always really visualized value has always really been this feedback loop of something i'm interested in or trying to figure out that becomes a um you know there's a visual representation of that puzzle that becomes a piece of art and in check's case it was many 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 layers of things and um then after it launched it kind of that feedback loop started again and we built some some uh some more stuff on top of it. So I think there's there's a related story in here that that's super interesting too, which is I, I, of course at this point everyone sees you know checks, sees open pensies, Christie's auction impending, and all that kind of good stuff, right? Um, and, and so therefore would like have the perception that everything you know everything's just perfect, meteor you know standard rise and everything. But like right. there was a process to get to here, right? Like like it's not just you oh, for sure. up and automatically the first try was was a was a home run. Uh, sorry to use the baseball analogy, but you've been in New York for long enough at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, cricket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so whatever the cricket equivalent is. Yeah. Um, so, so like it wasn't exactly a home run the first time necessarily. And I know you're a really big believer in terms of agile and iterative uh, progress and, and taking feedback loops, like you said, and, and going to the next stage at that point. Do you want to talk about that a little bit of what your mentality is there? Yeah, um, sure. So, so, yeah. so I think this idea of publishing – really didn't change between uh, what I was doing before this world and now. This idea of this constant conversation you're having with a network of people and testament to that activity is meeting Jalil. So you put your thoughts out into this network. Um, The chances that you're going to meet people that have far more, you know, of a set of aligned interests or far more complementary skill sets or taste and that activity of putting work out into the world constantly just kept reinforcing itself with things like that happening so it was either like introducing me to a bunch of people that i like spending time with or like getting you a little bit closer to the next idea so there's a lot of similar well, there's a lot of similar themes in the visualized value catalog of works, but there's maybe like a 1%, 2%, 5% difference in how you say the same thing or hover around the same subject matter. So really um, having that like constrained format, and if you're not familiar with it, the original visualized value aesthetic is really restrained to a simple set of rules. It's a black canvas with a single typeface and vector shapes essentially so straight lines circles um just the most reduced reduced aesthetic possible which really like in hindsight i think i have a better explanation for this but what it really forces is is like if you don't make any stylistic decisions or you're not trying to make something look a certain way you really put all of your energy into communicating the idea and that i think being able to work on that skill set publicly and understand what resonates and have that feedback kind of guide you one image at a time towards the next thing um all of the all of the things that were explored in nfts were essentially like taking that same that same process and applying it to the the technology itself and checks in my mind is like the ultimate expression of that in one packaged thing that doesn't come across as like an instruction manual necessarily or like a you know here's a something that is trying to be explained to you it's like it has um it encapsulates all of those ideas at like different levels of abstraction and i think um has resonated for that reason because there's like there's there are many layers at which I think people understand it. And in the last couple of months, having gone to a lot of places, uh, 
physically and meeting people and talking about it, it's really interesting to see what part of the 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 project or the concept or um, the process resonates with with different people. So um, yeah, it's uh, to answer your first question in a really condensed way it is fully iterative process and um doing that transparently uh in the same way that all of the visualized value of business was basically built transparently and every decision was uh communicated in real time we took that exact same approach with checks where um every part of the process was was shared in real time and that also, I think there's two components to that. One is like it's really creatively freeing to do that because in a environment like this where there is so much kind of s- speculation on what something is going to turn into and that's almost used as a feature by uh, in many cases where, you know, we're building a AAA game or we're going to, you know, create the greatest streetwear brand in the world, even though you have no experience building any of those things. Um being just completely transparent about what is what decisions are being made and what this thing is going to be once those things are built uh, was really one creatively freeing, as I said, and two, um, it really aligned everybody involved, and we built like an amazing network of people that, like, honestly, there are people that understand it like at a level of depth that I would never have uh, anticipated when we started working on it because that story is all out in the world. Jack, like the the part leading into that though, right? Where you do go very, very iterative, right? Which kind of implies you're releasing things in advance and those things are not always hitting in the beginning, right? Especially as you're evolving the product. Isn't that part scary a little bit? Like, you know, to put something out and, and, and of course put the effort into it, even with the mindset that you had in mind that, you know, it's all iterative. It's all kind of constant feedback, and I'm always going to improve. And, but isn't it a little bit scary at times to like push something out into the world with the premise? I think, it, I, I think if you do it enough times, it get it becomes the inverse, where the scary part is like not testing the resonance of the idea for a long time. When you're putting like every extra hour of work you're putting into something that some like you haven't uh, sort of tested that that resonance in some way feels like a bigger risk and a scarier proposition. And I think having published so much stuff on the internet, you go through this, there's there's like, I can't even think of the specific examples, but thinking back to like posting something early on in the, in the visualized value journey where it's like, Oh, this one, this image is not resonating in the same way. The last one did It's over. Right. Like we're never coming back. You're never going to make an image that's going to have the same level of resonance that this one did. And none of this stuff is linear. It's all um, all obviously just the the process of thinking and listening and not being like uh, there's this really delicate balance between like or I think it, it gets misunderstood that like being iterative is not um like you're not taking a great deal of care in what you're doing and i don't think that those two things are um is it that's not the case like you should put a ton of effort into doing the the best work you can but at the same time we kind of have to um accept when something doesn't resonate and 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 change direction but the ability i think to or the, the the ability to get that real time feedback from a network to me is like a huge feature of like building digitally native art and like before the art world like building things that people want to use. Yeah, that's that's really that's great insight and 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 I mean super super delightful to hear as well what your mentality is on that you know for myself I'm sure for others right in terms of taking that inverted mentality of not being nervous about it and and the opposite makes yeah sense. and I, yeah and i think the like the people who are along for like, the people who are interested in the thing you're doing like there's so much uh like the quality of the relationships you build in my experience at least is so is like people seeing you fail or seeing you like misstep and 
acknowledging that, you know, this might not have been the solution. We're going to try this. We're going to do this is like there is only upside, I think, to behaving that way, especially if you're, you know, if you're resource constrained, this idea of like the process, I th we, we kind of repeated this throughout is like the art is so much about the process and the like people's attachment and understanding of what we're building, I think is deeply related to understanding how much thought went into it and how many iterations happened and the things that we tried and even the things that like there's a couple of specific examples that uh, i'll let jalil talk about but like a couple of oversights that got called out and the way in which like the amount of care and attention that was on this from the people who were like following the story was so uh was was profound as well so can i, um, can I ask you a question julia before you, you jump in and and definitely going to pass it over to you and and you know in a second we're coming back for you soon martin don't worry that is that is coming soon enough um i'm, I'm going out for burger <laughs> fair enough so the the question i had like you were just saying jack and, and for you Jill, is what are you doing what is this whole thing that you're doing like how would you define what this overarching thing is that you're doing such that the community can latch on to the overarching thing and not necessarily a specific project. So that way they can take the wider frame on it, be tolerant of like the evolution of it because they're along for the whole ride and not just like an individual project, for instance. How would you define, what is it you're doing? Yeah, so visualized value has always been about this idea of like permissionless creativity, iterative, um, networked building and feedback loops where like my frustration with the agency world was you know business model the business model that i like spent 10 years of my life working in had fundamentally misaligned incentives like an agency business trying to take as long as they can to maintain a relationship with you know company of x size in these big bureaucratic machines and all of the content that kind of kickstarted visualized value initially was really driven by my attempt to break out of that model. So how can you best exhibit your skill set on the internet? So in my case, it was finding this really specific format that allowed me to constantly publish work that basically built a network for me that presented a ton of opportunities that were way more aligned with how I wanted to be spending my time, people I want to be working with, uh, things that I'd like to build. And that was always really the thesis behind Visualize Value. And I think what was almost like communicated without, like not explicitly communicated, but embedded in the work that we've been doing for the last few months is that with this much deeper level of connectivity on a network that allows you to own digital objects or publish digital objects. And like the, the initial kind of massive surge of interpretations and derivatives of checks, I think was so exciting for me to see after having worked for years on visualized value where the, the kind of, the curve to or the, the, the like the cold start problem in building a one person like creative enterprise is incredibly difficult and this was like an example of producing something that got people to take action on publishing work on you know removing the barrier between like i'm not an artist or i can't contribute to this or um it got people to kind of use their it gave like a almost a canvas for people to use their skill set on top of and like draft on this meme that we'd built and or not even built just co-opted and started to create um a, a movement around and that to me is like a a better again iteration of what visualized value is about and i would say like more philosophically what checks and opepin aim to accomplish is to, I think, at least in our view, express some of the fundamental values that create, like that enabled or uh, 
that inspired this technology to be created in the first place. So even the meme of a check, this idea of responsibility in self-custody and uh, understanding the provenance of something, being able to sign something digitally, be your own bank, all of the different uh, tiers of responsibility that come with like ownership in the digital world, like that you know, that's not on the surface of it, I think. But once you dig into the way we've put this together or told the story, to me, that's that's one of the most fundamental qualities of the project, too, is to, to kind of educate people on what is possible with the stuff we're building upon. And I think I think is a good transition over to Jalil in terms of, like, the way in which the project was designed is really stretching and um like really taking advantage of ethereum as a canvas in a way that um i mean i'm incredibly proud of and i the 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 um excuse me sorry i haven't had much sleep this week the um it could not be executed any other way, essentially. So it's like this feedback loop, even between Jalil and I, my understanding of what's possible based on the trust and the like shared tastes that we have built up over a number of years, that is really, it like massively accelerates what you can accomplish and even what you can dream up and realize as a function of just understanding what the, like the capability that you're, you're working with. But I'll let you little speak a little bit about some of the stuff because he's he has. Uh... I'll say I'll, I'll say a couple words um, on 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 this on this question regarding like the the visualized value. I, I think like because from an I, like I'm I'm first and foremost an appreciator of that brand, right? And it was what attracted me so much to eventually, I mean, uh, uh, become friends with Jack and and and. Um, now us working together but very simply in my mind what visualized value as an observer is about is um like a a a, a venn diagram of sorts of three things um ancient wisdom in in in, in philosophy um coupled with like just a certain understanding of markets and business and third being a citizen of the internet in this new digital age, right? Um, and sort of pairing that in the most concise and simple and beautiful way um, with digital art, which attracts, informs, uh, 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 gets us to yeah. think um, uh, and sort of is a force for action, at least for me, when I first was confronted with Jack's work, it fundamentally changed how I ran my business, how I, like, you can meditate on some of Jack's work for hours and gain new insights. It's, it's really a beautiful catalog of work. So, and that's, that to me is the purpose of, of art, right? Uh, if it doesn't sort of influence your thoughts and actions in a, in a, in a measurable way, then what's the point? Um, and what this then does on a greater scale is build community because it connects people through these values that are expressed in it. Um, and then, and then with, with something like checks, the crazy thing that, that happens, which, okay. So checks for me is like this fundamental expression and abstraction of what this new set of technologies, the blockchain uh, uh, enables us to do. And that's like, again, in line with this idea of what does it mean to be a, a, um, a digital native citizen of the internet with this new set of tools. As Jack said, it's our res responsibility to check, etc. It like perfectly embodies that in such an abstract and beautiful symbol, which then because it is so simple and restrained, enabled so many people to participate, take their own spins on it, etc., etc. So, but yeah, but to, like, pull it back to the original question to me that's what visualized value is about as an observer creating art that inspires us to think different and and sort of change our lives in a positive manner and and, and checks as a symbol is very much doing that um at least for me 
that's that's really really cool context to hear that that backstory and, and the frame on it, which we don't don't always get to hear. So super super cool and timely. Can we talk about that community piece for a second as well? Um, what what was that ramp up like in terms of building the community and and you know show, showcasing the overall frame, maybe explicitly or implicitly, in terms of what we were trying to do, what mission we were on here, build up your community over time, and and therefore evolve into you know new emerging trends and eventually, you know, checks, like we said, in Open and, and, and even beyond. Like, what was that What was that pathway like to building up the community and getting them to attach? I'm going to have a controversial answer here. So I, I tweeted this a couple of years ago or maybe in 2021. And it's like, you can't build a community. Like, this is a, in my mind, a fundamental misunderstanding. It's, I think the language of the tweet was, you can't build a community, but you can build something that builds community or something that you can build community around. And I think that like that statement of, of community building without understanding what the community is being built around is where people sort of swirl for a long period of time and where there is no robustness or anti-fragility to the community because these people don't actually have anything in common and in many cases community was in this world at least a euphemism for a price appreciation and that in my mind what we accomplished early in january was that behavior was transcending ownership of the token itself so people were participating in this whether or not they were you know holders of the artwork whether or not the artwork was up this day or down the other day or the price sorry was up this day and down another day it was in my mind just you a signal that you ta fundamentally tapped into something that means something to people and if you can create basically a conduit between people that appreciate those things or that thing then one plus one equals three in those situations in the same way that visualized value attracted people around the ideas that it was expressing and and the the like partnerships that were born of that the friendships that were born of that the things that were built by people that have this shared like vernacular or library of ideas that they came to uh came to build their relationship around it's it's like all this shared context that helps you comp accomplish things much faster and, and build things much faster and not kind of basically go through the awkward small talk phase of, you know, a physical interaction where it's kind of remarkable how the world functions that way, where you, you kind of meet your spouse in, or at least, you know, where like most people do in the, in the, in, actually it's probably not even true anymore. Right? But this idea of the, like the internet just collapsing the distance between people who have shared interests and uh, like shared context and can build amazing things together. To me, that is like really hard to replace. And it takes a, like a massive amount of time to build that. It's not something that even the volume of work does not do that. Time is a huge has a huge function to, to play in that where one of the reasons all of this stuff was kicked out really quickly in the beginning, because visualized value had already been out there kind of professing these values for years and years and years beforehand. And it just activated people that had kind of already subscribed to those things in a way that like they could do it against a shared symbol that kind of, that just had this massive compound effect and created this network in real time. Um, that was a long answer, but hopefully. I don't know. That, that's great. I, I also am a little bit nervous as I don't know what I just did. And I feel like we may have a follow on meme project coming out uh, about the, the perception of how communities build coming out of this. So I'm uh, a little bit <laughs> anticipating this now happening. Um, uh, Martin, I don't know if you're back for your burger, but if you are back for your burger, <laughs> whether it's true or not, um, over to you in terms of like, we're now merging this into Jack, the IRL Web2 world, right? And, and so the same premise exists of trying to build community and build community with a different audience, as we know, right, with the physical side and otherwise. 
is not familiar with Web3 and has not been down the exact same road, right, and, and all that good stuff. So what, what are your thoughts there um, in, in 500 words or less? Um, wh- what are your thoughts there? Uh, I, I, I make that joke to you per earlier comment, but um, what are your thoughts there in terms of how we're bridging that to the physical world now and like bringing Web2 people into this? And what's that narrative like? How, how do we convey that narrative such that people are interested, they can now grasp the, the thought process and everything that Jack and Bill were just describing in terms of the trajectory that existed? How, how does that happen? Now how? I mean, I think that um, actually it was best distilled by, by a guy called Richard Whittington um, recently in, on Artnet. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you can post up the, um, the, the, uh, the, the interview that they've posted for us. It was amazing. Um, but they showed, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> they basically showed, a, uh, did a really, really great article on the crossover. Um, and for me, it's like, I think that was the, that's the hard bit. It's like how do you how do you get the crossover between digital and the physical world, and how is it respected by all parties, and, and how is it understood? Um, <coughs> and Richard did a, a brilliant job of that. So yeah, I, I say I'll leave the answer to him. Um, have a look at the article. Um, it's it's really really good. Yeah, we will. We'll, we'll definitely, definitely check it out. Um, uh, Jaleel, Jack, you as well. I mean, your thoughts. This is new territory now, right? For, for as you described, Jack, it's been digital forever, right? Um, really digital. Yeah, I, yeah. I think. I think again. I'm gonna like maybe challenge the. Or this actually relates back to the last comment that we had, where it's like. This idea of community being misunderstood in the same way that Web3 or whatever acro- or whatever like synonym for that you want to use is misunderstood, where, where the idea is the thing that is valuable, not the infrastructure that the idea is executed on. And until I think that is a f- fundamental part of the approach, the thing that's being built is, is tied to the... To, the popularity of a catchphrase, basically. And in my mind, this works in the physical world because the idea has been translated to the medium in which it's being executed on in a way that is true to the original concept. So the idea of, or the the process, the way in which these prints work, this is not us pressing a button on an inkjet printer and firing these things out. It's us generating these outputs digitally, authenticating them, storing them on Ethereum, and then translating, basically creating one by one uh, a piece that represents the original piece and then authenticating that by hand. Like the, It's almost the inverse of the process that creates the, the digital piece where once the output is there, the work begins on the print side. And even thinking about what makes that work valuable, the the amount of time that goes into producing a print in this, uh, like it, 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 this way is significant. And there, just to go back to the top of the answer, I think my, uh, I guess my, The long-lasting belief or the thing that has remained to be true is is without an idea or without a, like, a set of values being continually expressed. Like You can't build a community of people that get, uh, like, can create something together if they don't really understand why they're there or what they're, like, what they're a part of. Uh, and then on the work side, I think people just appreciate good ideas and like whether like if it's the if it's just the the technology with the 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 kind of common thread to me that's i don't know that undersells whatever the work is you're trying to do because uh in the we've we've kind of succeeded really when the when we're not referring to this as the acronym that describes the technology and we're referring to it as the set of ideas or values that makes us us care about it or makes it useful or makes it interesting or beautiful or whatever else. 
So um, I, I think the, the, it's kind of the buzzwords are kind of useful on ramps in many ways, but then like you have to translate that to a deeper appreciation for something to make anything sustainable in my, in my view. That makes sense. Uh, live audience MBHQ, we've got, we've got Martin as well. We've got a, a sick crowd here. I'm just going to take a pause here for a second. If anybody has live, que uh, live questions, please make sure to drop them into guest questions. Anything you want on these topics or otherwise, these guys are certainly here for it. Uh, they are heading off in about 10 or 15 minutes to go have themselves a good time. Uh, so we've got them for about 10 or 15. I'm going to continue on, but I'll be monitoring in case anybody has questions about projects, where they're going or otherwise. Um, totally makes sense what you were saying, Jack, in terms of, you know, the product has to sustain, right? That's what creates community at the end of the day. And without the product and the connection in terms of what the mission is and, 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 and the journey and, and all that good stuff, the shared, the shared sense of values, right? Then there is no continuity, like you're saying. And I totally agree with that. that said, even with that in mind, you have to guess for the pieces that you're putting out, percent or, or how many are going to be uh web two purchasers do you think and how many are going to be web three purchasers what do you think that's going to look like so like people who like their first their first ethereum transaction oh, yeah. is that a fair way to categorize the the right. former i would say it's probably 80 20 in favor of um like ethereum native that would be my guess I think it's a, it's a, yeah, that would be, that would be my guess. I'm curious if you, Martin, you, you there, are you back to a hamburger again or are you, uh, you back, back for more? I don't know, no, we were just going to get ready to go and drink loads of McCullum whiskey in Brooklyn. That's all. <laughs> I feel so shitty being in your way right now as a result. <laughs> what is your take on this, right? Given the fact that you come from a world connection to Soho House, you know, yeah. certainly the art crossover that exists there. Do you agree with that? Do you think it's going to be 80, 20, 80 Web3 people who are purchasing, 20, you know, call it Web2 people where this is their first project? Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yes, I do. I mean, I think that we, what we see, <coughs> and the nice thing about it is that we're seeing both parties cross over. Both parties get into the worlds of each other and have a mutual appreciation. And, and what's great about it is that We've got best of breed on both sides. Um, and then there's like the little the little special things that Jack has thrown in, like the infinity checks and the physical verification with the thumbprint <coughs> to go with the digital verification as well. Like all of those little all those little verified and distilled elements make this a really unique and, and kind of special project. And I don't know if I'll ever do this again. Um, and I'm not sure what's what's what the next adventure is on this, but there will be one. Um, I, I just know that what we put together here, everything has felt like this beautiful 360 adventure. It's quite poetic in a way, especially with like the auction finishing on checks day 100. Like we didn't plan that. That happened. And the way that uh, our broader auction starts on Checks Day 101. I mean, we couldn't we couldn't have planned this. We couldn't have written it. Like it, it's it's amazing, and we're really happy that you know you're all here with us. What? Um, so we have a question from the audience, which I'll approach in a second regarding IRL. But one general question I have is. What should we expect moving forward as well? Anytime, should we expect anytime there's a pretty mega, especially Web3, Web2 crossover iconic element that exists, that there may be um, a collection or piece or something that comes out with, with the social commentary related to it, kind of signifying these big milestones and, and codifying them in some way? Is that the frame that we should have in mind as, as you know, as fans of, of what you're what you're all doing? Is that is that the lens? Is it it case by case to some extent and this just happened to fit well how are you thinking about that i think i mean in my mind it's the way we described what visualized value stands for like how things that are changing in the world relate to continuing to 
communicate those values. That's what we put into these projects, whether it's checks or anything else. I think even what we're trying to accomplish with OPEPN is basically a response to the, in, in our view, I don't know, I, maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, the flaws in the, the, the kind of PFP meta that evolved over the last couple of years where like we, we just got in this rut of repetition um, like mechanically versus really exploring all these different ways to uh, to build a uh, like a collection also this idea of this is maybe a longer thread to go into but the 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 unique identifier element of the PFP in like what we've tried to describe in the last few weeks is like a weirdly fundamentally flawed idea because it constrains how big that community can ever get. And if that's the, if that's the thing that you're attached to in my mind that, you know, that doesn't really, uh, I don't know. It's very hard to accomplish anything, um, significant without without like thoughtfully thinking through how more people can join this thing at different tiers i think that's a that's like a longer conversation but um the the two projects that are out there right now are very like almost fundamental like they're almost like yin and yang or opposites and one that is like totally immutable and is based around a single idea versus this really mutable experimental um 200 uh sequential releases that will all have a different dynamic in in some way shape or form so trying to like give ourselves a canvas where we can play at both ends of that spectrum too that makes that makes total sense i think it gives it gives everyone a good taste as well in terms of how, how you're thinking about it uh, we do have a question from the audience right now regarding irl so do you have any plans for irl activations for your community whether it be digital or physical collectors. Talk about Christie's, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've got <coughs> okay, three things basically, right? Uh, or, first, or maybe maybe they even meant inviting us to the to the whiskey and scotch party you're going to right now. Yeah, you're more, more than welcome and don't say mine. Um, well, well, yeah, three three things. Uh, first, my, my buddy Sean just came in, and, and he is who told me about Jack in the very, very first instance. Um, he is an MVHQ member as well. Um, so shout out to Sean for, for that. Secondly, um, yes, we are doing some IRL stuff. Uh, we are doing a talk um, with a, a fancy champagne tasting um, at Christie's on uh, Saturday, this Saturday, 3 to 5 at Rockefeller Center, where you can come and see the work. Uh, actually, uh, amazingly, in the window um, of Christie's next to Picasso and uh, Gerhard Richter, um, which is, is, I still don't believe to say that. Um, and um, third, that's from three till five, so uh, that would be fun. And then thirdly, uh, Jack decided that he wanted the reserve for the auction to be $8. Now, anyone that knows Christie's and anyone that knows auctions um, <laughs> would know that there's no way in hell that Christie's will give us an $8 reserve when they're usually putting up 10K, 20K, 30K reserves on their words. Somehow, we managed to get them to do it. Of course, about 100,000 people decided to try and bid at the same time, and we actually broke Christie's website, which was kind of epic in a way. So if anything, we'll be remembered for people that broke Christie's. So I'm quite happy about that. They're not, buy them. Um, <coughs> and um, lastly, with the... With the, three, with the three elements that we've been out of Christie's, um, a significant portion of any of the funds coming in for that is going to St. Jude's um, Research Hospital for Children, uh, which is an, <coughs> a really incredible cause that, that helps uh, kids with cancer. Um, and and it's, it's very, very special. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there you go. Um, we do have an IRL thing in Brooklyn. If anyone's in Brooklyn on Sunday night, and fancy some barbecue will be done at Hometown Barbecue, uh, probably around about 8 o'clock. Um, it will be lovely to meet you all, um, and we'll see you there, and we'll drink some more whiskey if there's any left.
What exactly are these eight dollar people thinking? By the way, is it is it you know maybe if I'm the only one who clicks and everyone will just totally not realize it's happening and I'm going to scoop it for eight dollars? Is that what's going on there? No, 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 no. Um, the auction at Christie's started with an eight dollar reserve, which is the price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got what you're saying. I was I was wondering oh, if yeah. official bidders were thinking maybe nobody else will realize I'll scoop it for eight dollars. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. It's been a long, long, long week. <laughs> <laughs> conceptual continuity is the answer yeah fair enough fair enough no it's great um i mean especially the saint jude's thing that's awesome and tying it in and i think if nothing else like the number one thing that i'm certainly taking away and maybe others is the the, the concept you said about actually having something solid for the community to rally around right and without that with it being a euphemism like you said for floor price whatever else there, there's nothing there and no continuity and i think that in and of itself is a really good lens for investing purposes and buying purposes for also for creating projects for people to have yeah. in mind. Super. I think, I yeah, that. it's like, it's fundamentally a communication problem. And I think that's the, that's the lesson from years of doing it is it's like scary how deeply somebody understands what you're about. If you've been putting your work out into the world and your thoughts out into the world for a long time. And this is like, 140 characters at a time for me for a few years. So I can't imagine what it's like for people that have been, you know, publishing their thoughts for a really, really long time. But that, um, whatever it is you're doing, even if you like don't have it figured out, like the process of figuring it out and making some output from that process is like ironically moves you forward way faster than trying to come to market with something that is completely perfect finished etc cetera, etc cetera, because all of the feedback is how you know nothing's ever done um just just an iterative uh process constantly that's so so good well guys i'm cognizant of time i don't want to be the person nor does anybody in the way of your whiskey anymore um mm -hmm. really really appreciate the thought really pumped for you guys as well i mean it's such a a thoughtful process you guys took to, to get here and merge together and all that good stuff so um congrats on everything that's happening really excited to see how everything pans out uh hopefully you'll be able to catch up on sleep afterwards but it seems like it's worth the ride so thank you again for joining today really really awesome to the live audience thank you as uh, as well like always everyone listening recorded as well um and yeah thank you again all we'll see everyone similar time next week thanks so much everyone thank you yes thank you